Hello everybody and welcome to uh, today's webinar. Um, I hope you're all well and staying safe. Um, so thank you for joining our webinar today on compliance with IEC 62368-1. My name is Anna and I'll be your host for today. We will be sending out the slides of this webinar to everyone for your own reference. During today's presentation, all of our attendees will be in listen-only mode, and if you're looking at the list of attendees because of privacy requirements, you will only see yourself listed. Before we begin, I'd like to go over the question and answer tools that you'll be able to use throughout the event today. To submit a written question at any time during the event, you'll see a floating toolbar in the lower right of your screen when in the full screen view mode. Clicking on the question mark button opens the Q&A panel and you can type your question in the rectangular space at the bottom. Then make sure you click the send button. We encourage you to submit your questions at any time during the presentation, but be aware that if, on, if only sufficient time remains, questions will be, at, will be addressed at the end of the presentation. Your questions will not be seen by any other attendees. So for our presenter for today is Alistair McLaughlin, who is Senior Engineer Product Safety Specialist at TuveSood. And it's over to you, Alistair. Thank you, Anna. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining. So as Anna said, this webinar is about the updates that you'll need to cover to comply with IEC 62368-1 and we'll be paying particular attention to the differences from the legacy standards. This is me. Uh, I'm a senior engineer at TUVSUD, as Anna said. Uh, contact details are there if you want to get in touch with me after the, uh, after the webinar. I've worked in uh, product compliance in one shape or form since the early 90s, and in safety in particular since the millennium. I've been with TUVSUD since 2009. I've got lots of experience with electrical and electronic products and with the legislation around the world for product safety. We're going to cover 6368 and its place in the law, the relationship between the law and standards and how these both relate to products. And I'll be explaining the standards terms hazards and safeguards, which are fundamental in 62368, and I'll explain how the hazards are classified. In the last section, I'll go over the key differences with the legacy standards 60065 and 60950. Particularly, I'll be talking about some of the changes that have got the biggest impacts. So firstly, then, the law. Why are we using standards? What do we mean by presumption of conformity? And what's the impact we're going to have with the December 2020 deadline? Aside from our moral duty, we've got a legal duty of care to our users. Uh, the law sets out a set of requirements across the world. We've got similar laws in the European Union, including the UK at the moment. We've got the Low Voltage Directive, Radio Equipment Directive, General Product Safety Directive, and so on. Uh, in the USA, we've got uh, OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, and as I say, similar legislation worldwide. The law gives us these broad principles that product must be compliant. But the broad principles are too broad to apply as a test, so we use test standards instead. Incidentally, the um, directives in the European Union are adopted into the member states' law as uh, regulations, and that includes the UK. And in case anyone's interested, uh, we'll still be using the same legal frameworks after Brexit, um, if you look at the uh, draft legislation uh, for, for the uh, scene post-Brexit. IEC 62368-1 is the international version of the standard on which all the other national standards are based. So the IEC standards are harmonized by, worldwide by countries that are part of the international certification schemes. There's more on that topic in our other webinars and videos. Harmonized means that the countries have aligned their product safety laws so that the IEC standard is agreed to meet those requirements. So you see there we've got the EN 6368-1 IEC 
and UL and Canada CSA versions of the standards. They're all based on the IEC version there. So the IEC version of 6368-1 is the basis for the EN version, the Australian, New Zealand version, the USA version, and so on. In the EU, you get a presumption of conformity in law by using the harmonized standard. So you need to check that you're using the current version of any standard by referencing the European Union's official journal. There are minor differences between the standards called special national conditions, and those are mandatory in the nations where they apply. Today, I'm talking mainly about IEC 6368-1 2014, the second edition of the standard. There is a third edition of the standard, but it hasn't yet been adopted as a harmonized standard in the EU. The official journal can be uh, confusing to read. You need to uh, look at the column headings. You'll see uh, on page one of the official journal, uh, the current standard is listed in the main column there. Uh, the date of the publication in the official journal is listed in the next column along. The old standard that has been superseded by the current standard is listed in the next one, the reference of the superseded standard column. And the last column is the date of cessation of presumption of conformity of the superseded standard. Effectively, the date the old standard expires. It may not show in that column for other standards, but you'll find 6368-1 has got a date in there because it publishes the date in the official journal if it differs from the date of withdrawal that's given in the actual standard. And in the case of 6368-1, there is a difference. So there it is, 20th of December, 2020. I mentioned uh, presumption of conformity earlier. Harmonized standards give a presumption of conformity with the essential requirements of the relevant directives that are listed in the official journal. So 6368-1 shows that your product complies with the safety law. It's been written to meet the essential requirements of the safety law. It's not mandatory for you to use 6368-1. You could use some other standard if you wanted to, but equipment that is manufactured and tested to the appropriate standard is presumed to conform with the essential requirements. So if you don't use the harmonized standard, then you lose that presumption of conformity. And that can hurt you if you ever have a problem with your product and you attempt to defend yourself in court. A little bit of history. Uh, the IEC 6368-1 standard has been around in development since 1999. Uh, there was a first edition published in 2010, and then in 2014 there was a second edition published. And now we actually have a, a third edition published in 2018. Sorry, I'll just jump back there. Um, we're missing an animation on that slide. I do apologize. Um, I'll move on. The harmonized standards withdrawal uh, is, is important for, for everybody. We've got the 20th of December deadline, uh, which means that the legacy standards 60065 and 60950-1 will be replaced by 6368-1 on the 20th of December, 2020. The original deadline already passed. Uh, the date of withdrawal published in the standard was the 20th of June, 2019. The EU decided that that wasn't long enough and they granted an extension to that through to 2020, 20th of December. After this deadline, there are very few countries that will actually accept the, um, the, the legacy standards there. It's mainly similar as a standard 6368, but there are some significant differences, which means there's no simple translation from the old standards. Some of the tests are actually very different and they're very often more stringent, so beware of that. I'll talk a little bit about some particular examples later. So we're going to look now at hazards and safeguards, which, as I said, is an essential part of 6368. We'll talk about risk versus hazard, something to do with the classification of 
hazards and some safeguard strategies. So risk is hazard multiplied by exposure. That is, if the hazard is high, then the risk is low if there's very little chance of exposure. This is where safeguards come in. 6368 classifies hazards and safeguards systematically. Hazards are classified as class one, two, or three, according to their severity. Class one is that there is essentially no hazard at all. Class two is something that isn't directly hazardous itself, but may cause an adverse reaction that puts people in danger. Um, for example, a part that's hot to touch might not actually directly burn you, but it will make you jerk your hand away, which men might then lead you to a separate injury of some sort. Whereas class three is something that's directly hazardous. We also classify safeguards, which I'll come on to in detail shortly. More detail on classification in the next section, but first, what are the types of hazard? Let's look at an example product here. We've got a photocopier. In the photocopier, we've got um, mains, high voltage for depositing toner. These present a risk of electric shock. We've got uh, fire hazards, possibly from the mains voltages, the low voltage and high power circuits, and also we should be considering the fuels such as toner and the paper within the product. There are mechanical hazards, fairly obviously, the moving parts rolling the paper around inside the equipment. Uh, and chemical, thermal, and radiation, not major risks in this product, but um, consider the toxicity of toner materials or inks, overheating of motors, and the bright light that's used for scanning the image. All of these need to be safe in foreseeable conditions. So they need to be avoided in normal conditions and under any abnormal operation or fault condition. I'll talk more about uh, normal, abnormal, and fault conditions shortly. The model for protection is that uh, safeguards are interposed between the hazard and the person or the property that's at risk. 62368 talks about reinforced safeguards that fully reduce the risk to acceptable levels. Uh, and it also talks about basic and supplementary safeguards that act together to reduce the risk so that if one fails, the other still protects. So the hazardous energy source has a safeguard interposed between it and the body, the person who's at risk. A good example here is basic insulation plus protective earthing, which should be familiar if you're already dealing with the legacy standards. So injury doesn't occur when the energy source is non-hazardous. If an energy class, uh, if an energy source is class one, there's no need for any safeguard. Class one energy sources are inherently non-hazardous. For hazardous energy sources, we need safeguards. So as I've said, basic insulation is there, or basic safeguards are there to protect us in normal and abnormal operating conditions. And a supplementary safeguard is there to protect us in the event of a fault, including if the basic safeguard itself fails. A reinforced safeguard is a single robust safeguard that's effective under normal operating conditions, abnormal operating, and single fault conditions. A good example for one of those would be reinforced insulation, which again would be familiar to you if you've been dealing with the legacy standards. Different types of safeguards are better than others for different situations. Equipment safeguards are always useful because they don't require any prior knowledge or special actions by the person who come into contact with the equipment, they're built into the equipment. Installation safeguards are dependent on the installation being carried out properly. They're useful when a safety characteristic can only be provided after installation, for example, equipment being bolted to the floor to make sure that it's stable. Behavioral safeguards are the least reliable in our hierarchy here. Uh, they're useful when the equipment requires an energy source to be accessible, um, such as when you have to have a, a laser um, accessible in, in a piece of equipment. Uh, we have a behavioral safeguard through the use of warnings, 
What do we mean by behavioral safeguards? A little bit more detail there. The uh, behavior that's reasonable to expect based on the knowledge and experience of the person in coming into contact with the equipment. We classify people uh, in three ways. Uh, we should assume that ordinary persons have access to the equipment by default. 6368 also defines instructed and skilled persons. They have a reduced amount of protection required for them because they have additional knowledge. A little bit more detail on those on the next couple of slides. So an ordinary person, that's the general public. Consider that it might include children, depending on the equipment, and elderly or impaired persons, uh, depending on the equipment again. Are they exposed? Do they have risks associated with their use of the equipment? An instructed person is somebody who's under supervision or trained by a skilled person. Technicians uh, operating specialist equipment provided that they've been trained to do so. And a skilled person is someone who is so knowledgeable they need no protection apart from their own skill. Here in the safety test lab, we are skilled persons at TUVSUD. Electrical and electronic engineers and service engineers might be classed as skilled too, depending on the equipment type. So for an ordinary person, remember that's a user or a passerby, the equipment must be safe under normal and abnormal and single fault conditions. So uh, we need protection against um, the class one, no protection, sorry, against class one, uh, a basic safeguard against class two, so that we have a tolerable level of protection if that basic safeguard fails because they're not being directly injured, they're only being alarmed by the class two energy source. And a class three energy source, we must have a reinforced or basic plus supplementary safeguard. For instructed persons, they understand something about the hazards of the equipment. So we actually allow instructed persons access to class two energy sources. There's no safeguard between a class two energy source and an instructed person required, but otherwise we protect them the same as for ordinary persons. A skilled person is so knowledgeable that they know, need no protection apart from their skill. So the skill safeguard is there protecting the skilled person against the class three energy sources, and that's all they need. How do we decide if someone is being exposed to a hazard? Well, we check its accessibility. There are various test probes used. These uh, diagrams here are two of the test fingers used in 62368. Uh, they're based on the biometric measurements of uh, population samples. Uh, the tapered finger on the right is a worse case than the straight finger version on the left. The tapered finger is used when children are likely to be present because it represents their thinner, slimmer, longer fingers um, that uh, get into places where my, uh, my blunt adult fingers won't go. There are other um, uh, probes for particular clauses. These two are for openings required for terminals and for slot openings in a piece of equipment. When you check the accessibility, you need to consider whether any doors or covers or controls might be adjusted or opened by the users, including thinking about replenishment of consumer, consumable materials like paper in a printer or ink in a printer or something like that. Safeguards need to be tough enough to do their job. So we do mechanical impact and drop tests and so forth. And we also check that materials don't deform at high operating temperatures. Uh, the two figures that I've got there, figure 10A and figure 10B, are actually impact tests where a steel ball is being dropped. That's the uh, parts that are labeled one and two in the two uh, diagrams there. Uh, the steel ball is being dropped directly onto the uh, target equipment, labeled three in the diagram, or swung to impact the side of the equipment, uh, labeled three in figure 10B there. So some example safeguards, uh, electric shock, uh, we put insulation in between the uh, hazardous source and the, uh, the, the users. Uh, insulation can include air gaps as well as solid insulation. 
uh, we can put protective earth in place and we can have barriers. Barriers are allowed to be of conducted material if there's sufficient air gap to count as insulation. For electrically caused fire, we want to reduce the power so that uh, there's not enough power to start a fire in the first place. And also we can use low flammability materials, materials that have got a good flammability rating. More about these as we go on later. Mechanical energy sources, we've got uh, reduced forces to make sure that the uh, energy is low. There's, there's little chance of injuring somebody with a reduced force. Or again, we can put barriers in place to prevent access and make sure that the equipment is stable and not going to fall over onto anybody. Chemical energy sources, for a start, avoid harmful substances wherever you can. If you can use a substance that's not harmful to people, then, then do so. Uh, barriers in place to prevent access, extraction of fumes, and as a last resort, instructions on the proper use of uh, harmful substances. For thermal energy sources, keep the equipment cool with fans, heat sinks, and the like, or put barriers in place. And radiation sources, again, you see we've got barriers in place, barriers everywhere as a safeguard example, uh, but also reduced energy levels. If we don't have to have hazardous energy as a radiation source, then it's best not to. Enclosures, uh, people who are familiar with the legacy standard often think of in, in, in terms of uh, enclosures. Um, so a photocopier might include the following, a fire enclosure, a mechanical enclosure, and an electrical enclosure to prevent access to those hazards inside the equipment. Those enclosures need not be the same structure. Um, in a photocopier, they almost certainly won't be. Uh, if there's no hazardous voltages in the mechanical area, there's no need for the mechanical enclosure to be acting as an electrical enclosure. Enclosures themselves mustn't be hazardous, so they must be stable, free from sharp edges and points, and mechanically strong enough to prevent access to hazards, as I've already mentioned. And you need to think about that in all states that the equipment is going to be used in, so opening the doors, loading the equipment with uh, paper or other consumables, and unloaded, whichever is going to be the worst case. Here are some of the more commonly used safeguards for electric shock. Functional insulation isn't actually protecting us against electric shock. It might just be there to minimize the risk of ignition or fire. But basic, supplementary, and reinforced insulation correspond with the safeguard types. Basic, supplementary, and reinforced, as is fairly obvious. Um, they provide the class of safeguard you'd expect from their names. They need to meet the dimensions that are laid out in the standard, as you can see here on the chart. Double insulation there, I've included. It's not a term that's actually used in 62368, but it's equivalent to basic plus supplementary insulation, and it's a legacy term that you'll find in um, 60950 and 6006 by the legacy standards. Protective earthing is a supplementary safeguard that's often used in conjunction with basic insulation. For heat hazards, um, the simplest thing to do is to avoid having high temperatures by using fans or heat sinks or things like that. But also consider if you've got flammable liquids like uh, ink solvents within a piece of equipment, then you need to keep those liquids away from parts that get hot and restrict access to hot parts, uh, use barriers that are thermally resilient materials. And if parts need to get hot to do the equipment's job, you can use warning markings. This is known as an instructional safeguard. If you have circuits that are high enough power to be potential ignition sources, the important thing is that fire mustn't escape the equipment. So we need to limit the propagation of fire. Uh, we can do that by providing overcurrent or over temperature protection so that when the energy level goes high, the uh, overcurrent or en over temperature protection kicks in and cuts the energy out. We can just avoid having high temperatures in the same manner as I've talked about there for thermal risks. Put our combustible materials away from any potential ignition sources. Limit the quantity of combustible materials, 
use materials with low flammability ratings and put fire enclosures or barriers in place. So flammability ratings of parts, the um, standards that uh, are expected to be used are the IEC 60695 uh, family of standards for flammability rating. That's uh, directly equivalent to the UL94 uh, standard. Um, UL94 is so commonly found as, as, uh, as a standard for materials. That's why I'm mentioning it here. And it's important to know that it is directly equivalent and actually references back to the IEC 60695 standards. So we've got different flammability ratings, HB, V2, V1, V0, and 5V. Um, HB is the horizontal burn rated, um, the minimum flammability rating that we expect for any material used in IT or audiovisual equipment. The V rated um, uh, classification is for vertical burn tested. Um, and V2 is not quite as good as V1, which is not quite as good as V0. So uh, they, they, they're from least protection to most protection, you can see there on the slide. Parts that are inside a fire enclosure, V2 is generally acceptable, and V1 is uh, for parts that form the fire enclosure. You'll see more detail on that if you dig into the standard itself. Fire enclosures themselves, um, top and side openings and openings in the bottom of the enclosure are permitted so long as they don't allow foreign parts to fall in and start a fire or allow burning material to fall out of the enclosure and set fire to the surrounding environment. These principles are common to the legacy standard, so they should be familiar already. Ordinary persons mustn't have hazardous uh, moving parts accessible to them uh, and consider covers and interlocks uh, used to prevent this, um, the, the, the acceptable safeguard methods. Um, informally, and I must stress that this is an informal test, you can check to see whether or not a part is uh, hazardous as a moving part by putting a pencil in there. If the moving part damages the pencil, it's most likely going to be hazardous. There are some standard calculations that I'll show you in a table, which is coming up on the next slide. But consider, is access normally allowed uh, for ordinary persons or for service persons? Who is it who's getting access to these parts? And um, how sensible are they? How much skill have they got? So to summarize, uh, a risk is only as great as the hazard and the exposure together We've looked at the different types of hazard and the classes of safeguard, and I've talked a bit about accessibility. Next, we'll look at classification of energy sources, uh, the energy classes, and a little bit about normal, abnormal, and fault conditions, what we mean by those. So for our electric shock, we've got ES1, ES2, and ES3, um, ES standing for electric shock or electric source, whichever you prefer. Uh, ES1 is safe to touch, uh, low voltage or current, and it stays below the ES1 limits in normal and abnormal conditions and below the ES2 limits if any basic safeguard fails. ES2 uh, might cause pain, but no direct injury. It's exceeding the ES1 limits, but it stays below the ES2 limits in all conditions. And ES3 is anything that is a direct injury hazard. It, it's exceeding the ES2 limits under any conditions. So high voltages are permitted if the current is low enough. You can see the values there in the table. I won't just read them out. But notice that there are different values for DC and AC, somewhat as expected, plus you'll find different values for higher frequencies and combined AC and DC circuits, such as power over Ethernet. PS levels for ignition and fire, you can think of that as being pyro source um, as a mnemonic for it. So PS1 doesn't exceed 15 watts after three seconds. That's a very low amount of power there. PS2 exceeds PS1, but doesn't exceed uh, 100 watts when measured after five seconds, 
and PS3 exceeds the PS2 limits, or we've just decided that it was PS3 and haven't bothered to actually measure it. We'll do that with a main circuit. There's no need to actually measure a main circuit. It's actually potentially dangerous to measure the power that's available in a main circuit. So we can just classify things where there'd be a danger for doing the test. These measurements are taken in normal operation of the power source into the worst case fault of a load circuit and also under the worst case fault of the power circuit into a normal load. I'll emphasize that again later because it is somewhat different to what you'll find in the legacy standards. Mechanical hazards, MS1, 2, and 3. Again, MS1 is safe to touch. Uh, it stays below the MS1 limits in normal and abnormal conditions and below the MS2 limits in a single fault condition. And MS2 might cause pain, but no direct injury. It's exceeding the MS1 limits, but it stays below MS1 in normal abnormal and single fault conditions, and MS3 is anything that will cause a direct injury hazard exceeding the MS2 limits under any conditions. Some examples here, again, I won't just read out these levels here, just note the types of mechanical hazard that are being considered. So we're looking here at sharp edges, corners and points, moving parts, fan blades, those formulae are explained in the footnotes to the table in the standard itself. Exploding parts, think about components and pressurized systems, and the equipment mass when we're considering stability or wall or ceiling mounting. TS1, 2, and 3 uh, for thermal hazards. Uh, TS1, safe to touch, again, uh, stays below the limits in normal conditions and below TS2 limits in abnormal and single fault conditions. You'll notice that's slightly different to the preceding ones. TS2 might cause pain, but no direct injury, um, and it stays below TS1 limits in all conditions, and TS3 is a direct injury hazard exceeding TS3 limits under any conditions. The temperature limits, again, I'm not going to read out uh, the, the, the numbers in, in, the, uh, in the table there, but you'll see that different materials and applications have got different limits reflecting the burn risk for those materials and their use. Uh, there's a separate table covering the temperature limits for insulation, um, including uh, electrical insulation systems. I've mentioned normal, abnormal, and fault conditions a few times. So normal operation um, is significantly different to what some people will think of as being the normal operation of a piece of equipment. The power supply is run at a, a voltage range extended to plus and minus 10% of uh, the, the range. So if you rate a piece of equipment, let's say 100 to 240 volts, then we actually need to test it at 90 to 264 volts. We also will test it at normal and reverse polarity, and the equipment will be loaded up at maximum to uh, simulate the worst case load that the equipment will experience. This might be somewhat different to your intended operation of the equipment. 6368 also separates abnormal operation from fault conditions. Um, legacy standards didn't do that. They just dealt with uh, normal and fault conditions. So this is a little bit uh, new. Abnormal operation is that the equipment is being misused, but it hasn't actually been broken in this process. Whereas a fault condition is that the equipment has malfunctioned, the equipment has caused the fault, whereas abnormal operation is that somebody is misusing the equipment. We always apply these one at a time. The old single faults approach still applies. Abnormal operation examples, equipment for uh, or parts for short-term or intermittent operation are operated continuously if that could occur under a single fault condition. And that could include parts like motors, relays, and heaters, which are normally only operating occasionally within a piece of equipment. Equipment for more than one supply, connect it to all the types of supply that it's designed to be connected to all at once. Uh, voltage selectors effectively set the voltage selector wrong and see if that causes any kind of hazard. And ventilation openings cover them open, cover them over with paper. 
one at a time, not all at once, but uh, ventilation open, openings are covered with a standard paper. Uh, it literally is a standardized kind of paper. We've got a whole stock of it in our lab. So the last section covers differences between the legacy standards and 62368, including some particular cases that have got high impact. So self safety extra low voltage is a term that people will be familiar with from uh, the legacy standards. It's not actually used in 6368-1, but the ES1 concept is broadly similar in scope and in its intent. TNV circuits are classed as a type of external circuit and have got their own extra requirements. More on those in a couple of slides. Uh, although this slide says that uh, TNV circuits are classed as ES2, not all TNV circuits are ES2. I'll show you those on the next few slides. So a TNV1 circuit, uh, that, that is a, a circuit whose uh, operating voltages don't exceed the limits for cell and is subject to over voltages from a telecom network or cable distribution uh, system, i.e. This is a, um, a, a signal only telecoms line that is routed outdoors. So it's not got any ringing signals on it, uh, but it is being routed outdoors. So it might get subject to lightning strike on the, on the network. Uh, we class those as ES1 circuits and we have to apply table 14, which I'll show you uh, on a later slide shortly. TNV2. Um, that's where we do have some ringing signals. Um, so we've got some higher voltages that exceeds the cell levels, um, but it's not subject to over voltages from a telecom network. So that is not rooted outside. Uh, we treat those as being ES2 because the ringing signals actually should fit it into the category of being ES2. So we use the uh, ES2 requirements to assess safety here. Uh, this is typical for something like a local area network or, or similar, or, or a um, private um, telephone system within a building. TNV3 is a public switch telephone network or something similar to that. Um, the voltages are going to exceed the cell levels and um, it's routed outdoors, so it might uh, be subject to over voltages from the telecom network or cable distribution system. We treat those as being ES2 and transients uh, need to be dealt with according to table 14, uh, which I'll show you, as I say, um, on, on a later slide. Cable distribution systems um, includes things like antennas and other coaxial systems, and they're dealt with as being external circuits and have got some special requirements for isolation. Uh, more on that shortly. User is a term that's approximately equivalent to the ordinary person, and similarly, operator is approximately equivalent to an ordinary person. But as I mentioned earlier, the ordinary person definition is wider than the user definition in that it applies to passers-by and the general public. There is no legacy equivalent to the instructed person definition. Um, they're a middle level between the ordinary and skilled persons. And a skilled person is the replacement in 62368 for the old definition service person. In 60065, they had a definition for potential ignition source, and the levels involved are the same, but 60065's definition of potential ignition source actually only covers 62368 definition of an arcing potential ignition source. It's important to note that 62368 also has a resistive potential ignition source, which has got similar energy levels involved, the 15 VA involved, but uh, there, there are some, some small differences there that are worth uh, paying attention to. So as promised, I mentioned that I could talk about external circuits. The types of external circuits are listed on table 14 in the standard. Apologies that that's quite a small copy of the table there for you to look at. Um, it includes um, the 950, 60950s, cable distribution systems and telecoms network voltages, 
and it gives special requirements for their isolation uh, based on the amount of transient voltage that we'll see on them. There were some difficulties in the wording for antenna circuits in the 2014 edition of the standard. These have now been fixed in the 2018 edition of the standard, and uh, by default, it's of sort of we're working to the 2018 wording uh, for antenna circuits uh, based on our understanding and communication with the technical committee. Batteries, um, I'm calling out here as a special case in the differences between the standards. Uh, the legacy standards weren't quite as comprehensive as um, Annex M in 6236A-1. Um, it now lists out a particular uh, set of acceptable approval standards for different battery types. So it used to be that a lot of people would come to us with a battery that had a UL approval, and that used to be okay, but it's certainly not enough anymore. Um, the standards that are called out in Annex M for batteries are all IEC standards, and they're not directly equivalent with the UL standards, unfortunately. Um, you will find that uh, the more reputable battery manufacturers are moving towards uh, getting those IEC standards applied to batteries. So they are out there. Uh, you just are going to have to dig, I'm afraid, for them. There's also uh, assessments for battery protection circuits, which are similar to what you'd find in the legacy standards, including uh, non-rechargeable and rechargeable types, and some special tests for certain battery types. Batteries that might be carried loose have got some short circuiting tests. Lithium-based batteries have got some uh, more robust tests than you'll find in the legacy standards. Um, lead acid and NICAD batteries, and uh, there are also some uh, tests against ignition for, of electrolyte gases and tests against uh, spillage of electrolytes. So some more comprehensive tests you'll find in the battery section. Temperature limits, I did call out that the temperature limits were dealt with slightly differently. Um, TS1 sources mustn't exceed the TS1 level in normal operation or TS2 levels during abnormal or fault conditions, and TS2 sources mustn't exceed TS2 limits in any conditions. So this means that hot parts must not become accessible even during abnormal or fault conditions. And this, is, um, th this has been causing some people a little bit of trouble uh, with their compliance, because in the event of a fault, in the event of a, a piece of equipment breaking, we've got to still be protecting people against hot parts inside the equipment. So uh, yeah, th this, is, this is a little tougher than we used to see. Electrical insulation systems as well, EIS, have now got some more stringent requirements. It used to be that you would find that the individual parts of an electrical insulation system, if they had approval to certain temperature ratings, then we could take the lowest temperature rating of the, uh, of the parts that make up an electrical insulation system and then say that the whole electrical insulation system meets that requirement. That's not permitted in 6236.8-1. It says that uh, any electrical insulation system must be approved as a whole to 60085. Um, so any electrical insulation system that exceeds class 105 limits of uh, 60085 must be approved to 60085. It's much tougher than it used to be. And again, that's causing some, some problems to our clients. Electrically caused fire, uh, I touched on, on this a little earlier. Um, the classification of circuits is more comprehensive than you'll find in the old legacy standards. These, uh, the classification PS1, 2, or 3 is always assessed with simulated fault supplied. The worst case uh, fault to the power source and then to the load circuit. We've also got potential ignition sources, uh, which is not something that you'd be familiar with if you were only dealing with the IT standard in the past. Um, and Amex Qs 
uh, limited power source is similar to the limited power source that you'll find in um, the old IT standard, but um, there's more emphasis now on uh, control of PTCs, making sure that uh, positive temperature coefficient resistors that are used to limit power must be approved to that particular standard I've listed there, 60730-1 specifically clauses 15, 17, and Annex J15 and J17. Uh, th this is trickier than, um, than, than we used to have to deal with. So uh, be aware of that if you're planning on using a limited power source. So in summary, we've looked at uh, 6368 and its place in the law. And in particular, we've looked at the 20th of December 2020 deadline. We've looked at hazards and safeguards and how we classify hazards across the different types of hazard. And we've looked at how uh, 6368 differs from 60065 and 60950-1, in particular some special cases of differences with high impact. So that's everything that I've got in my presentation. Now we're going to be taking some questions. So thank you all very much for listening so far. And let's see what questions we've had come in. Okay, thank you for that, Alistair. Um, I can just give it a couple of minutes if anybody's got any questions that they'd like to to send through um, and Alistair can answer those for you. If not, um, by all means, you're welcome to send those offline. Um, so let's just have a look. Um, I think we'll, uh, we can follow some of those up. I think what we'll do, Alistair, for now is we'll finish up with the, um, the presentation. Um, Thank you. That concludes everything for our event today. Um, and on behalf of Alistair, thank you very much for your time today. And thank you all for joining the event. Um, so um, we do have some other events following up. We have some more webinars coming up um, in our schedule. If you're interested, um, you can head over to our website, www.tubesu.com forward slash UK to see our schedule. Um, if you would like to speak with one of our specialists, you can email Alistair at alistair.mclaughlin at tube-sued.co.uk. Um, so many thanks again. Stay safe and um, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks again. I've noticed we've had some questions come through that uh, we, we we missed there, so I'm just going to have a go at answering them. Um, there was a question uh, talking about wall and ceiling mounts as mechanical hazards. How might one test these products for compliance? So what that test involves is uh, mounting the product onto the wall or ceiling according to how it's uh, instructed to be mounted. Um, there is a standardized wall construction uh, given in the standard um, and then loading the equipment up with an additional weight equal to three times the mass of the equipment to show that the, uh, the, the mounting means remains uh, fixed in place. There are also some shear tests and some pull tests uh, that are done on the mounting means um, on, on the appliance. So, um, yeah, they're, they're, that's the kind of thing that will be done. There's more detail in the standard themselves. I also noticed that there was a question um, asking um, if you place a product on the market now, can you still use the existing standards, uh, uh, e.g. 60950? Um, yes, you can do that. Um, but the date after which um, you can't put product on the market under that standard is, um, as I mentioned a couple of times, uh, 20th of December uh, 2020. So it's fast approaching. And this means that uh, any product unit that is placed on the market after that date should be being tested to 6368-1 rather than 60950. Okay, there were no further questions asked, um, so uh, I'm 
no, hold on, I see another one. There's another one. So, yeah, we, <laughs> they keep coming in. Okay, so when determining which standard is applic applicable, say, for a 3D printer, how do you determine if 62368-1 and the LVD should, apply, should be applied, or if the machinery directive and 60204-1 should be applied? Right, okay, that's a very good question. Um, it, the the uh, 3D printers um, for hobbyist use are generally coming under the IT standard, so 6368-1 would be appropriate. And if they're for industrial use, then uh, the machinery directive would generally be applicable to it. You will find um, that there are definitions in the machinery directive um, of what constitutes a machine rather than a, a, a IT equipment, business equipment, and so forth. So I would refer you to my colleagues in the um, in the machinery department for that. Okay, now that is all of the questions that uh, we we've had. So uh, thank you again. Thank you all very much for listening, and um, we'll see you again on the next webinar.